I'm delighted to have the opportunity to introduce Air Marshal Andy Turner, a good friend of mine. We've worked together over uh, actually uh, more years than probably either of us uh, care to remember. And as you can see, he's there in uniform because he is in uh, an extraordinarily busy job now uh, uh, in charge of RAF capability. That doesn't necessarily sound incredibly glamorous, um, but in many ways, the RAF is no longer just the Royal Air Force. It's the Royal Air and Space Force. Um, uh, as um, the chief of the air staff, or I suppose chief of the air and space staff, uh, as he might prefer to be known uh, in the future, reminded us uh, recently. Um, and that development of new capability um, uh, uh, is, uh, uh, over the next few years, is absolutely crucial to the future of the RAF and indeed um, to this country's modernising defence forces. And I know that Andy will not only be able to talk about uh, what he's doing on that, but but I'm sure we'll be happy to take questions on how that fits into the broad number, broader modernization of defense, because of, although obviously others have responsibility for the land and, um, and sea uh, forces, Andy is intimately involved in all of that uh, as well. Um, he has the most extraordinarily packed career. I must admit, Andy, I didn't know myself until I sort of um, decided to remind, refresh it um, for this introduction. Um, but is very well equipped to deal with the new um, requirements uh, that the RAF has, having a degree in oceanography and cosmology, and then decided to fit in the bit in the middle um, uh, in, his, uh, in his career. So very well equipped to take the RAF into space. I don't think he's planning to take it beneath, beneath the ocean, but uh, the RAF, of course, does fly off the carriers um, uh, as well. And, and, uh, and, and as I said, he may mention that, but he's also got master's degrees in strategic studies and international relations. So a very distinguished uh, academic uh, career and loads of um, uh, um, study and uh, an input into the various military courses. But just take a look at his, um, his operational career. Uh, a helicopter pilot, over 5,000 hours, 87 kinds of aircraft. Um, and of those 5,000 hours, about 40%, something like that, a third to 40%, on operational tours, essentially everywhere that we have deployed over the past several decades. So Northern Ireland, Central America, but not many of you knew that we've been there. Um, the Gulf, um, uh, Pakistan, Afghanistan, the Balkans, uh, etc. A range of uh, command uh, roles um, and some very important staff appointments in the MOD. He's also, um, I guess, our host at the RAF Club, or one of them, because he's the vice president, I think, uh, Andy, aren't you, of the RAF Club, uh, and a range of other, he has a range of other interests uh, uh, as well. So absolutely delighted to have uh, such a distinguished um, uh, officer, a good friend, um, and somebody who's done a lot of deep thinking about not only the future of the RAF, but the future of defence. Uh, and it's a great privilege, Andy, to have you online with us today. Thanks so much for joining us. Great. Well, Mark, thank you very much indeed. And um, Stephen, um, a remarkable opportunity to follow uh, my boss and others. And I was tracking in the last few weeks, actually, a, a really august company of previous and future speakers. So it feels, I feel as, as ever in these things, a slight imposter uh, being uh, amongst you all. But um, it's a great privilege to come and chat to you today. And I, I wondered, uh, about what to say, and um, I thought I would, which is why the title's slightly striking perhaps, I thought I'd probably speak about things that have gone really badly wrong in my time, um, rather than some of the things that Mark has touched, touched about, because as we would all say, you know, we learn by doing or fail fast or so, but I genuinely have uh, learned a great deal from the things that have not gone so well, actually, and um, uh, my, my career is littered with things that I've failed at, actually. So I've picked out three separate events, they're all slightly operational, but I think there's sort of wider leadership lessons in each of them. And, uh, and I, you know, maybe they're just a springboard to go take the conversation elsewhere and, and further. Uh, but a couple of sort of shaping points I thought would be useful to start with. And, and the first one is that I see the words leadership and management as fundamentally and uh, at origin, extremely difficult and different things. Um, leadership, in my mind, is the expression of generating uh, unique um, opportunity and power and effect and that outcomes with our people through inspirational vision and wisdom, maybe leading from the front a little bit, sort of visible skin in the fight to a certain extent, 
and taken them to places which they wouldn't have ordinarily uh, mobilized themselves or taken them to in their own right. Leadership for me is a sort of is, is more about chemistry. Uh, these uh, is what we would refer to in the armed forces as the function of command. Uh, it is this idea of propelling people to a place where they where they didn't expect or need or want necessary to go. Management, on the other hand, is much more about finding the way to get to that place. It is a, a spirit of maths and physics in a way. It's about KPIs. It's about uh, holding to account and, this, and the detail of taking somebody through a series of steps with metrics and resources, you know, real grit that will ensure that the plan is delivered, that will ultimately take us to the vision and destination. So management for me feels you know, a little bit more like maths and physics, where leadership is chemistry. Um, management is more control, where leadership is command. Um, and if we can separate these two things, I think it actually helps us define what we really mean by leadership in a much more clear way. It allows genuine leadership to, to sit above and, uh, uh, and around an organisation and management being the DNA of what's going on inside it. So it, it, it just an interesting reflection uh, to start the conversation and perhaps one we can follow through on you know, questions later on. I think the other thing I'd start off about is something I've learned a great deal more about in the last 10 years um, as a subject, but also uh, about myself, which is to know yourself as well as you possibly can uh, to inform the sort of approach you might take um, as a leader or, or a manager. Really instructive course I was on years ago at, Sh at Shrivenham, our joint staff college, where we were taken through a number of psychometric tests, uh, the, the normal barrage of Myers-Briggs, but a number of others as well around Clifton strategies was an, another one within it. And a psychologist was brought in uh, to study uh, the anonymous uh, outcomes of these, these tests, this barrage of tests. And there were six of us together. And he, before, you know, within about five minutes, before we'd known what he'd done, he'd studied the results of these cards that were anonymized, as I say. And he said to, the, to, said to, the, to the group of us, he didn't know which six he was talking to of 24, but he said, right, in, in this team of six, this one will be your doer. That one will be watching the clock. This one will go and get the resources. This is the one you want really as the leader. This one you need to get rid of immediately because it's just going to get in the way throughout and with and for everything. And this one will be the one that's looking after everybody else. And when you look at us, because we knew who we were, he didn't know who we were. Uh, it was a really powerful, penetrating statement of not only who you are, but what you are in and amongst the team. It's, it's, it is instructive and rather reflective that the one we had to get rid of immediately was a special forces SAS officer because uh, he was just going to be too creative and disruptive to work as a close member of the team but there was it was fascinating that actually without knowing us from Adam uh, uh, ab initio five minutes of study of anon anonymized cards it picked out our characters and told us what our roles would be in a generic team I thought that was absolutely fascinating so my sense for this is you've really got to know yourself in order to be you know a sort of credible powerful leader and in saying that i'm thinking and i'm no great psychologist or stu student of this but I, I imagine and think that our formative years are broadly from age 15 to 25 and after that it's really quite difficult to change who you are you can hide the bits you don't like and promote the bits you do like and keep close a mentor to tell you when you're straying into the grim and gloomy boundaries of the sort of dark sides of your character. But it's probably quite difficult to properly, fundamentally and profoundly change who you are. So I think there's something around knowing yourself and knowing what's your part in the team that is a really instructive and useful origin position to think about as a, uh, you know, as a leader. And, and so my, my five premises that I'm going to sort of draw through and out on as I, as I sort of talk through this are sort of five working principles that I use uh, and, and I'm going to take three examples where I, I sort of failed to use them and made, made, made some big mistakes. The first one is um, I recognise increasingly now the more senior one is as a leader, uh, I absolutely view myself as a conscious incompetent. Um, I, I know that I cannot be the best pilot on the base. I, I am a long way distant from understanding the order of battle of Russia, and some of the technical geometry around their you know, weapon systems, the electromagnetic environment, the orbital geometry of, of Chinese satellites, let's say. But I do know, because I'm an incompetent, that it's really important to gather around me this complementary team sense, people who really do know what that was. Mark, you were brilliant at that in the NSC 
you know, you had a sort of co a, a, a colorful group of people from a rich array of departments that we used to all contribute our bit and you were brilliant at summarizing and bringing that together into something that was credible and transmittable to the prime minister under stress. So, you know, I think, you know, knowing who you are and what that team brings together is really good, but knowing that you're a, in a senior leadership sense, you know, genuinely a conscious incompetent is quite a useful start point in, in, in humility and otherwise terms. Um, the second point I'd say is a uh, takeaway will be this idea of uh, as a leader to, to try and genuinely get absolute clarity. We talk in the armed forces about being clear about the vision, the mission, uh, the intent, what you're trying to really get after two or three steps away, the main effort, what's most important in all the things you're doing, you know, who's doing what and, and how we're going to coordinate and talk to each other. So this sort of sense of um, vision, mission, intent, main effort, scheme of manoeuvre, you know, it's, it's a sort of military language to basically mean that if we can be really clear with what we're trying to achieve and how and why, and what that means to two levels above and outside of you, um, in a business that might be your, your shareholders or the stock market or some insurance entities, um, you know, then, then I think our, the, the purpose of any one act can be seen in context in a much greater way. And I think that that's really quite helpful. The third point I'd alight on is, this persistent need to try and align authority, accountability, and responsibility. Three words that sound very similar. In our world, they have very different meanings. But if you separate the authority for an act from the accountability for that act, suddenly you set up an immensely tension-filled environment amongst a team and an organization. So alignment of this authority, accountability, and responsibility, I think is really, really key. The fourth point I'd say, is about visibility as a leader. Not so important as a manager, a manager is still important, but as a leader to be visibly engaged with the organization that you're trying to lead, to understand as best as you're able to the most basic problems our people are facing, uh, you know, I think is a great, is a, is, can be inspiring to the young people or the new people into the business, but actually can, you, can, you can bypass levels of leadership between you and them to properly understand what, uh, you know, our people think. And I think that's a really helpful, useful way of getting access to what's, um, you know, what's massively important. The last point, uh, which, and all these relate, in fact, they're interrelated, is a principle that we try and use but fail at in the armed forces, which is to delegate to a point of discomfort. And delegating to discomfort means that you, you, you've passed down tasks and resources, finance, if you like, or reporting, to a point where you genuinely feel uncomfortable. And this is when our people will feel genuinely empowered by, you know, your sense of trust in them. I mean, trust is two ways, but delegate, delegate does not mean abdicate. Delegate does not mean that you let go and you walk away. Delegate means you're letting somebody run with some authority and empowerment, uh, resources or a task or a mission or some such, such that it can really thrive. And this is where we've seen the most dramatic innovation and creativity. People have seen an absolute clear sense of their part in the plan, they know what their resource boundaries are. They know how to get extra help when things are going wrong or if they can't achieve their task in the time frame or within the resource boundary. And you see them deploy all sorts of remarkable and unique outcomes. So this idea of delegating to discomfort for me is, uh, uh, has historically worked really, really, really well. So com conscious incompetence, clarity, um, the alignment of authority, accountability, responsibility, the sense of being involved and visible, and lastly, delegation to discomfort are, for me, the sort of critical components of you know how to lead in some way there's lots of other things but i lighted on these as i was uh, dr driving a couple earlier this week to uh, between places i thought these are things i should probably um uh, stress to some extent so some instance um uh, a little bit armed forces related that sort of connect to this first one is around afghanistan i think i can't remember mark when you were the when you were down in helmand uh, but they, this is uh, an incident that happened in 2008 and it was around that time when uh, Mark Carson Smith actually was trying to sort of move the Kajaki Dam generator up into up into the dam to sort of restart the power to allow Helmandsies the the idea that they'd have indigenous power from their from their uh, from their from their, their, their land and their, their local rivers, so this is a big operation. Um, it involved uh, a whole brigade, uh, six months worth of planning. And it was a significant event. And um, it's not really about the dam or the or the, the generator, the, the story. But the the, the the big idea is that um, in the should we say the skirmishing around this as a form of distraction and uh, de, you know de, uh, deflection of what we were trying to do. There were a number of associated assaults put into different Taliban places 
around the North Helmand Valley, um, up near sort of a place, if you've heard of it, called Goresh, which was you know, a significant hotspot for us, but it was just significantly south of Kajaki. So this area um, was tense, you know, we were constantly being shot at there. It was not uh, straightforward to go there and you never went, you never went on your own, you know, you always went as a pair. Uh, and often if you could do, you'd always go by night. And if you had an opportunity, you'd have an Apache hanging on your, your right shoulder. This is me flying a, a Chinook now. Um, it was not me flying this night, but I was uh, some way away. And that's part of the dynamic that, uh, that I encountered. That halfway through this mission, uh, this assault uh, where we're putting lots of troops on the ground to, dis to, to uh, remove the Taliban's uh, focal point from where we were trying to aim at, a dam, to somewhere else, was, um, you know, was a crucial moment. And in the course of this night, a uh, very black night, uh, one of my aircraft, and you have to see me at this point, I'm the, I was the Chinook Force Commander, all of those aeroplanes worked for me. They weren't owned by me, Her Majesty owned them, but you know, I was responsible for them over that tenure. One of the aircraft landed unknowingly in a hole in the ground. This hole was the size of a tennis court. And the aft wheels went onto the ground as it does in a Chinook. Uh, and normally you place the front wheels down on some land, but unfortunately there wasn't any. The hole was too big and the cockpit landed on the other side of the hole. And in the course of the cockpit landing on the other side of the hole, the cockpit broke off. So now the flying controls are not actually connected to the rotors. Uh, the, they've been lengthened to such an extent they've broken. Uh, nor were the engine controls uh, in the cockpit connected to the engines or the fuel system. So we've now got an aeroplane that's entirely without a functioning set of controls. And they've got a crew that were essentially uh, remote and detached uh, from their ability to interfere what was going on with the aircraft. Quite an interesting uh, conundrum. I mean, if you were in a sort of relatively normal place, Hampshire, um, it would be a, a challenging uh, subject to probably debate and, and deduce in a quiet pub somewhere whilst you wait for the engineers to turn up. But this was not that place. Quite soon after they'd landed, uh, the engines uh, were stopped through um, hack soaring through the fuel line at the back of the aircraft going into the engines and that indirectly leads the rotors to stop, all went quiet. But at this point, um, there was very clear, we had clever technical means, where it's very clear Taliban chatter uh, uh, about wanting to follow up on this obvious uh, form of a crash that had occurred. So we knew that we were in a pretty sticky place with uh, that was that we were not well prepared to respond to a substantial Taliban assault. So we were very in a very difficult. I was about 200 miles away up at uh, Kandahar, which was a long way away in terms of communications. And certainly I was not able to get sight or eyes on what was really going on. So we're suddenly in this really difficult place where the crew, you know, four people, four guns facing probably a hundred, uh, were absolutely not in a position to defend the aircraft. So we had to make some really rapid decisions in the absence of knowledge, in truly ambiguous circumstances. And uh, our priorities at this point were to save the crew, protect the secrets, and then destroy the aircraft. That was what we concluded in about 20 minutes was the necessary outcome. Uh, the, the aircraft we determined was in, this is in very rapid, in the darkness with, um, with rounds going off around us, or them, we concluded that the aircraft was probably unrecoverable in, uh, in, any, in any near sense, and certainly would have taken a long time to fly out, understung by another Chinook to fly away from the crash site. So we concluded really quickly, it was about protect the crew, destroy the secrets or, or contain the secrets, lots of papers that we had in crypto and things like that, but then we had to destroy the aircraft. So quite an uncomfortable position as a, you know, the, as the Chinook Force Commander, not really knowing what's going on, trusting through this delegate to discomfort position, this idea that we, we, we couldn't walk away from the aircraft and leave a reputational hazard, you know, photographs with people stood on the airplane later. So we, we very quickly called in um, air support where Bob used to operate in the, you know, in the medium altitude with big bombs and we blew the aircraft up. And uh, it was uh, destroyed to smithereens by several 2000 pound bombs, which, you know, leave bigger holes than the aircraft landed in as a consequence. So it was properly destroyed. The crew extracted, secrets you know, contained, and very little was actually heard about um, the incident at all, uh, other than through the normal military command chains, which started with, you know, on the phone, we started with, you did what? <laughs> uh, around, around blowing the aeroplane up. So it was interesting. I mean, I think one of the things I've learned in, as you grow through leadership, is this idea that the further away you are from the, uh, the quick, you know, from the front line, the more ambiguous things become. When you join the Air Force, if they say be somewhere at eight o'clock, one minute passes too late. You know, you need to be there 
on or at the time. Things are a bit like that Microsoft color palette. It's either black at the top, or sorry, at the bottom, or white at the very top. The more you move up the leadership chain, the more ambiguous um, challenges, information, data becomes. And you're hovering around that middle part of the Microsoft color palette. You know, is this gray grayer or the other than another one? I can't see at the moment. And I think our decisions have to become inherently based on less certainty of knowledge, both, you know, is there more knowledge out there to be had? Is it accessible today? Can I interpret it in a way that's uh, you know, sensible in the time frame that we've got? And, you know, bluntly, am I able to make a decision quickly? So uh, we learned a great deal from, from that night. Uh, you know, one, don't land in holes. Uh, secondly, uh, you need to act really, really quickly. You need to prioritise what's most important really fast, and you need to delegate really low down to the individuals who really understand what's going on and, and not bother them too many with too many questions. We learned a really great deal, which was useful um, because it happened again about four weeks later. And in my tenure that ended shortly after this point, we ended up, I ended up destroying two of my aircraft uh, and uh, it led obviously to, to a significant reinvestment program that we're going through now. But the second aircraft incident was something very different. It was where you know, the Taliban had shot and hit one of our aircraft. It was grounded. Luckily, it had a very high degree of force protection. There was a lot of paratroopers inside it. And as a consequence of that, we were able to secure the terrain. But even after having done that and waited for the light, the daylight of the day, it was still deemed uh, judged impossible to recover the aircraft and it was not worthy or worthwhile doing so. And so we covered it with anti-tank mines and, and, and blew this one up as well, having recovered the secrets. So it was interesting. I, I didn't expect as a leader of the Chinook force or as the commander of the Chinook aviation force in Afghanistan, to be facing these sorts of decisions. I think we are, we're confronted with things you don't expect more often than you plan for. I think any prime minister, any CEO would know that. But you, when you are placed in those positions, you might be the worst possible person to take the decision. You might be bereft of the information, too distant from it, and therefore you're only really gonna get in the way. And my sense for this particular incident, the first of the two was that, you know, I was not gonna be able to materially help. Once they'd made the decision, on the best possible information, it was my job then to you know, give them the confidence to follow through on the actions and then stand behind them when the obvious inquiry um, played out, which, you know, in hindsight, judged uh, similarly to the conclusions we had, we had you know, together deduced. So some interesting thoughts there. So I think that feels like this alignment of accountability, authority and responsibility very much was held with them, but also this idea of delegate to discomfort. It was very uncomfortable. Uh, hearing just on, on straight voice call, no data, no video, no pictures, you know, what was the state of this aircraft with, with about 60 minutes to make a decision and exit everything from that area. Difficult, but hey, you know, that's why I guess we paid the green shilling. The second incident uh, was much more of a protective period, two years worth, in fact. And in, in, in a later tour, 2011 now, I was in our permanent joint headquarters in North London and given the responsibility to plan for and deliver the, at the, the exit from Afghanistan, uh, the, the so-called exit that was uh, scheduled for 2014. And this was about our drawdown, the transition of security responsibility to the Afghan National Security Forces, and then the, the retrograde, the, the exit, the, re the recovery of all of the freight men and personnel, women and material. Now, in all, that was roughly 10,000 people, 3,000 vehicles, about 5,000 ISO containers in, in all. But the real challenge for us was that we were in around about 125 different locations in the Helmand province area. And we had not yet at that point fully transitioned security to the Afghan National Police or the security forces in any way, the army, and there, wasn't, and there was only a very nascent Afghan National Air Force. So, you know, it was tough. And at this point, as many on the call might know, that Afghanistan was managed in the, or commanded in, in Helmand by a sequence of six month tenures by Army and Royal Marine Brigadiers, each one arriving with their own sense of what needed to be done, quite a, a sense of independence and, uh, you know, a, a very high uh, media prominence and profile, and therefore the sense that, you know, they were very much in charge of their region and their area and responsibility for that tenure. Now, you know, I, you know I was never in that position, so I, I can't imagine how isolated and challenging that must have felt. But in my role back in North London, it was to overlay a structure over a succession of eight different brigade commanders that would that led us ultimately to a position where we could safely exit from Afghanistan and Helmand and, and Kandahar provinces whilst also recovering all of our equipment 
and then recognize that we'd probably be subject to some sort of NAO scrutiny of what we left behind or what we had to destroy or how safely or how efficiently we got everything home. So we made a lot of mistakes in this. We, strike, we tried initially to be too assertive. We made some bets on how fast we could transition security responsibility. We we're working very close concept with the US Marine Corps and the wider US military machinery that was essentially equipping uh, the Afghan armed forces. Uh, you know, and, and it was a, a series of bets that we over over promised and um, uh, under resourced quite early on, but we had to start somewhere. And we ended up over the, the series of six month cycles, as I say, working through the idea that we gave each of the brigade commanders a particular piece of the journey in Afghanistan from where they would receive it to what they needed to hand over. And this was expressed in the number of sites that we had, the amount of uh, uh, Kandaks, uh, you know, Afghan battalions that were fielded, the integration of the police, the amount of poppy cultivation that we were denying, and the ability for us to also to retrograde material, get stuff out, draw down on the vehicles, agree what we're going to hand over to the Afghans, and, uh, you know, transition the security function to uh, the, the provincial leadership team and, and the local army uh, contingent, two or three, um, two or three corps as it was in, in Helmand province really tough stuff and, and the, the tough stuff here was about the idea that we were imposing on brigadiers and brigades that felt they were very independent in a space over a time and tenure we were imposing on them that they, that, that they had a part in a broader plan and it was really important that they followed it and that it didn't become it more expansive and make the challenge of transition and exits more difficult the, the, the key point here being that there was an overriding political intent that was endorsed by nato by the various heads of state, certainly our prime minister and the president of the United States, that this was the plan. And um, as we all know from the, the dead Prussian clouds bits, you know, the military is but an extension, you know, of, uh, of the armed of diplomacy and politics at work, but also the civilian leadership of the military is a really important function in developed democracies, not quite so the case, should we say, in Sudan today, or, or maybe in Eritrea, but, you know, the civilian control of the military is a really important construct that we must follow. And ergo, the, the exit date was 2014. We had to be out in all respects in good order, bringing everything we needed home and be subject to retrospective scrutiny in some way, whilst also assuring as far as we possibly can the security of the local population, the development of prosperity and the denial of poppy cultivation. So quite and some interesting, uh, com, com, potentially conflicting and contradictory challenges there. But I'm happy to say that, you know, over that time, uh, that we extended, we, we were able to exit every single item that we thought would be important, hand over what we didn't and actually leave and remediate um, uh, forward command posts, uh, vehicle checkpoints and uh, permanent patrol bases in a way that, um, you know, was, uh, you know, creditable. And I think if you look back through the contemporary history, the last, say, seven years or so since 2014, you know, security was very much held down without being political about where we are today. And you could argue the Taliban was surprised by our exit as, as, uh, as, as the contingency plan's execution was for us. You know, the security in Helmand was sort of not, was, it, was, a, was adequate for an Afghan definition for the last um, six years or so. So the lid had been put on it. I have no ability to comment on what it will be like into the future. But this idea that we transitioned in, in good order, exited in good order, and left the population in a better place than we found it in 2003, I think is a is a is really creditable and uh, it's a great credit to those in particular those that took the brunt of the pressure from the enemy you know, the taliban in this case you know uh, in helmand valley on the ground in dusty and windswept places and lost you know uh, 454 of our very brave soldiers sailors and airmen in, in the consequence of that slightly differently the third example is around a program of change that i led and a, a number of others have had a part in leadership that I led to its conclusion recently, which is the transition, you know, this is a highly programmatic UK based conversation now around the, the, the transfer of our military flying training system um, from an old school approach, uh, very much based on sort of 70s technology to the latest technology possible. So this is not a small enterprise, uh, 7.4 billion pounds worth of a programme. Uh, 250 aircraft, seven bases, a thousand people. So relatively complex, uh, complex system of work, um, and one that uh, needed a gigantic in, um, investment of technology, virtual stuff, digital connectivity, emulations in the air, synthetics on the ground, 
better neural predictive technology around human performance and how people learn and ultimately the, re the reduction of three to four air stations because we no longer needed them uh, because we were using less planes because we we're doing more simulation uh, and the recapitalization of all these fleets of aircraft uh, le leading us to a sort of wholesale reprovision of this capability whilst at the same time continuously flowing crews to the front line meeting you know our requirements of the navy army and air force and training a huge swathe of um, friendly foreign partners mostly from the middle east uh, the saudi arabians UEs and Qataris uh, through our flying training system, which remains and, ha and has a sort of slightly gold standard appeal to uh, air forces around the world. Not an easy journey, though. You know, if there was to be a, a conservative, statically stable group of people in the armed forces, it's probably the flying training experts. Um, Bob would probably smile at that. You know, but the the idea of a, a qualified flying instructor sort of leading with technology is sort of not should we say, innate to that, that group of people. So firstly, it's a very deeply conservative organization to, to transition. Secondly, we intentionally tried to bring in a contracted, part contracted service, um, which was about buying a training service provider, influencing them with our ideas, and basically offloading the risks. The third dynamic to this, because of that second point, the, the service provider, was that we as, you know, me as a helicopter pilot, suddenly in we're engaging with Japanese banks and foreign equity to try and find the capitalization of this program, which as businessmen and women on this call, you'd find as sort of first, it'd be a first, first interest around shareholder uh, money raising in the markets and other things. But I can tell you as a sort of helicopter pilot who's been shot at all over the world, that's, that's not my necessary skill. And so it's definitely, a, we learned a, a, a tremendously different language, how to talk about risk, financial risk, uh, market re related risk not tactical risk in the way that we would otherwise characterize it and you know it's a it's a really really difficult thing to move over because the people ultimately i needed to buy in to the delivery of the service were you know those that were the least accepting of, of change so a difficult leadership challenge around cajoling people um, moving them down the way and uh and, and helping them understand you know that we, we're not going back you know that we burnt the bridge, and now we have to make what's in front of us work. Um, you know, so my people will recognize that, you know, I'm, I'm not a big rear view mirror, mirror man. You know, what's happened has happened. Our problem is what's in front of us, not what's behind us. We should learn from the past in a way that history is genuinely the toolbox of the future. But, you know, the, the stuff in front of us is what we've got to confront and deal with. A little bit like in Helmand Province or in Belize or in or in Iraq or in, you know up in Leyla Dak in the high north in, uh, in India you know it's, it's no good looking back and, and hand-wringing we've got to look forward so it's some tough challenges and we got a lot of that wrong you know the workforce wasn't prepared to move as fast as we had it has had hoped so there was some optimism bias in there uh, the technology didn't mature as fast as we had hoped and so the simulators didn't work like we had hoped but we had divested aircraft and so we were no longer able just to fall back on live flying so we had some tough challenges there uh, the delivery of the equipment was slower than we expected, so we ended up with a lot of people waiting between courses, which became very prominent in the media, uh, which led to a reputational damage around the system that was state-of-the-art, world-leading, but it was no longer obviously that because there was lots of negative commentary around it. Led ultimately to our new Secretary of State, you know, Ben Wallace, uh, passing three tasks out to the service chiefs. The one that came to, uh, the one that came to Sir Mike, my boss, the Chief of the Air Staff, was you know, hashtag make it work, you know, and, and that was a sort of Twitter post, you think, oh, you know, so it's, it's, it was really uncomfortable. Um, but I'm pleased to say that we learned a great deal from failing in this way, from seeing the challenges around our people, from the lack of investment by the company in the tech early to, to service clear and certify the simulators. We accelerated a lot of the training of these people waiting between courses, so-called holding pilots. A lot of them were used in very productive areas. In the meantime, some transitioned into space uh, satellite steering responsibilities and roles so they weren't wasted in any sense but um but i do think you walk away from something like that it's quite a big program so seven and a half billion pounds and 250 aircraft and seven bases a thousand people you know and you, you're not going to get it right in one go and i think no matter how much we can learn from our consultancy partners or best practice if you're first out the door doing something for the first time it's going to be problematic i reflect on uh, on Dyson's Hoover, you know, the 600th variant went to market, not the first. It's not, it's not a eureka moment in these big tra transitions. We have to be a lot more 
uh, patient, I think. I, I learned patience with my team and people around accepting that we, we did not get it right in the first instance and very much needed to move on and go quicker. So um, just some thoughts, some different sort of circumstances in my recent past. There's a load more things I could talk to about the ideas uh, of you know, where I've confronted difficulty, had to overcome things. And certainly I've drawn these lessons across to other places. But I leave you the thought that, that leadership is profoundly different to management, that, I, that knowing yourself is absolutely at the center of being a great leader, knowing your team and selecting them for their complementary skills and characters is probably more important than knowing yourself, but you can't do one without the other. And lastly, these sort of principles around conscious incompetence, the clarity of direction and leadership you're offering, the idea that you're going to delegate to discomfort, the clarity and visibility that you can offer your people ultimately, and the sense that you align accountability, authority and responsibility is that are the kernel, the center, the origin, if you like, of um, that I've discovered uh, to, of making successful change and or leading complex organizations. Thank you.